Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at the biochemical basis of life, biological molecules, monomers and polymers, condensation and hydrolysis reactions, and then we'll finish with a summary. So we don't need to look far to realise that in the natural world there is such a huge variety of life. Even just looking at the animal kingdom alone, we can see things like insects, fish, mammals, dogs, reptiles, all sorts of different animals pop into our heads. And then of course we've got other kingdoms like we've got the plant kingdom, We've got fungi, like mushrooms, and we've got things like bacteria as well. And when you consider all of the life, there's so much variety in their size, shape, colour, functions, reactions, etc. that you think that they're all built up of lots of complex differences. But despite all of this enormous diversity in the life on Earth, every organism depends on the same biochemical basis of life. And we call this carbon chemistry. So even though there is such a massive diversity in all the organisms, they all boil down to the same kind of molecules. And we call the study of these molecules that give rise to life biochemistry, and therefore there's a similar biochemical basis of life. And it all centres around an element known as carbon, which has particular properties allowing life to exist. The common ancestor that gave rise to all of us uses this carbon chemistry, and because all life is descended from this, Despite all of our diversity, we all base ourselves around carbon. So down here we would have seen the last common ancestor, which is currently unknown. As it evolved into various species, of course through time, different branches branched off into different types of organisms and different kingdoms as well. For example, on one extreme we have the archaea, which are a specific type of organisms which can withstand very tough environments. We've got animals and plants, commonly called eukaryotes and we have bacteria too. And while there are significant differences between all of these, they all rely on carbon chemistry. So what makes living things different from non-living things are particular types of molecule based around carbon and the important properties that it has as an element. So carbon as an atom exists with the ability to form four bonds. So carbon as an atom has the ability to make a bond with four other structures or four other atoms. They can be different groups or the same group. But the ability of this means that the carbon atoms can bond into lots of different things and bond together to form more complex molecules. And you can imagine that if they keep forming different bonds, each of them being allowed to bond to four things, then the ability to make a complex molecule, which could be very large, is very high. So we can make lots of different sizes of molecules based on carbon, and it can join to lots of different chemical groups. And actually what we find is that carbon as a skeleton like this acts as a backbone for organic or carbon containing molecules and these are found in all living organisms. So the carbon chemistry is based on the fact that carbon combines to lots of different things and when it does it acts as the backbone for the organic groups. And organic always refers to carbon containing. So when you think of inorganic we're thinking of ions or things like zinc, copper, water, things which don't have carbon in them. When we think of organic, we're thinking of things like sugars and proteins, which we'll talk about next. So the biological molecules which make up life are based on carbon, as we just said. And there are four main types of biological molecule found in all organisms, regardless of where they belong in that family tree. And those four types are carbohydrates, sometimes referred to as sugars, lipids, sometimes referred to as fats, we have proteins, and we have nucleic acids like DNA. So these are the four groups and within these groups there are lots of different types. For example there are many types of proteins which build up the body. There are many types of sugars that we can find in our food and in the body too. And all of them are based on carbon but some of them have key features where they contain a small number of other chemical elements. So let's take each one in turn. Carbohydrates you can work out what they contain from their name. They contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And if you look at the name, we've got carbo for carbon, hydra for hydrogen, and eights usually refer to oxygen. For example, when you see something like sulfate, it's sulfur bounded to oxygen. So when you look at this, this is an example of a carbohydrate. And let's look for these various elements. We can see carbon various times, hydrogen in lots of different places, and it contains oxygen too. Lipids contain the same elements as carbohydrates, so that's carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. But it just is arranged in a different way. So we can still see that we have carbons, usually in a long chain, with hydrogen atoms and oxygens normally at the end. 
So they're the same elements as carbohydrates, but a very different structure overall. Proteins can have more than this. They have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they also contain nitrogen in an amino group, and they also can contain sulfur for some particular types of amino acid. So here's an example of an amino acid, and we'll talk about what amino acids are in just a moment. And it's part of a protein. And we can see that we've got this carbon element again with hydrogens and oxygens, but we also have a nitrogen, and we have sometimes this sulfur group, which isn't always present, but when it is, it's usually in a very low number. And then finally, looking at nucleic acids, which is that fourth group, they contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as before. They contain nitrogen like protein does, and it also contains phosphorus, which is another non-metal element. So looking at this, it's quite a complicated molecule, but we can see carbon again forming that nice backbone through the structure. We've got hydrogens and we've got oxygens. We've got a few nitrogens this time, usually bound in some sort of ring structure. And we've also got a phosphorus atom, usually just the one in a nucleotide. So as you can see, all of these biological molecules have the same feature in common. There's a carbon skeleton forming the kind of backbone or foundation of the molecule. And they usually have hydrogen and oxygen around them too, but then other elements sort of wedged in there. They often contain lots of atoms compared to something like a water molecule, which just has H2O, three atoms. But these tend to have many tens of atoms, sometimes more. So we often call them not just molecules, but macromolecules, with the macro meaning large, molecule meaning a group of atoms bound together. So in order to understand how biological molecules assemble themselves, we have to understand the concept and difference between monomers and polymers. So a lot of biological macromolecules don't just exist on their own, but they exist as what we call polymers. And a polymer is something which is built up from lots and lots of repeating smaller building blocks, and those building blocks individually are called monomers. So let's show an example of this. Monomers are individual molecules making up a polymer. You can see by the name we've got mono, meaning one, so that's one single unit, polymer meaning many. So lots of these one units join together to make a many unit. So just to illustrate that using a kind of Lego brick idea here, we've got three monomers, monomer number one, monomer number two, number three, and if you add them all together, you get this chain, and you stick them together into one single polymer. And this is how most biological molecules exist. And it's this concept of building up larger, larger chains of molecules which help us understand how plants can get so tall, how are their stems so long? How are our bones so long? They're not made of individual units. They're made of lots and lots of units joined up into massive structures that allow us to be as big as we are. So by definition, a polymer is a long chain composed of many individual monomers which have been bonded together in a repeating pattern. And the point is, it is a repeating pattern because usually there's some sort of structure of the units following a sequence, or it can be the same unit one after another in a massive chain. So for example, in carbohydrates, the monomers are known as monosaccharides, and the polymers are known as polysaccharides. So the saccharide part refers to sugar, and we either have one on its own as mono, which is the individual unit, and then when they're joined together in a chain, we have a polymer, and this would be a polysaccharide. So you'll notice that with biological molecules, the mono and the poly bit stays the same. The actual name of the bit after that is what defines it into which group. So saccharide is referring to carbohydrates. When we're talking about proteins, it's slightly different. The monomers, we call them amino acids. And then the polymers, when lots of these amino acids join together, are called polypeptides. So it's not as simple as carbohydrates this time, but we have one unit as being an amino acid, and there are lots of types of amino acids. And remember, these contain the elements of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. And then as we join these up into long chains, we form one long polypeptide. You can kind of think of a, as a peptide as an amino acid, so poly meaning lots of them. In nucleic acids, we have the monomers known as nucleotides, and polymers are polynucleotides. Sometimes you will see it as mononucleotides as well. So here's a string of nucleotides as a polynucleotide, and one of these single units would be a nucleotide. So hopefully you can see the similarities between these groups as we go through. The only one that's slightly different are the lipids. 
They're still macromolecules built on carbon as we said before, but they're not really classed as polymers. They don't have smaller repeating monomers. They may have an extensive length like the rest of the molecules, and they may extend much further than proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. But they're not made up of units that repeat themselves. They're simply a very long chain. So actually what they're made of instead are a number of different base units joined together in a non-repeating pattern. So the general structure that we tend to see is a molecule known as glycerol. And then when glycerol is bound to these units, these tend to be identical to each other. And these are known as fatty acids. And altogether, the structure of glycerol bound to three fatty acid makes a triglyceride. So now that we've gone through what the difference is between monomers and polymers, we have to understand how they're formed. It's really important because during the survival and the lifetime of an organism, things need to get broken down and some things need to be built up. For example, when we digest our food, we need to break down polymers into smaller units so that we can send them around the body and use them. If we're building our bones, if we're growing through childhood or a plant needs to reach the sun, we need to build up larger molecules from smaller molecules. So we need ways and we need to understand how we go from one to the other and back again. So we've said that polymers are formed from monomers and this is done by what we call a condensation reaction. So there'll be two types of reaction we need to talk about, one where we build and one where we destroy. So when monomers come together and they form a polymer, we call this condensation. And a condensation reaction has particular features. In a condensation reaction, there is a bonding of one monomer to another. Whether that other monomer is on its own or it's the end of a chain, doesn't matter. So a monomer is bonding on to either an existing chain or another monomer. And when this happens, not only does the bond form, but a molecule of water is formed in the process too. So let's have a look at this. We've got monomer one and monomer two, and they're coming together. And in the coming together, they make a polymer. And in this case, we've got two. So we're going to call it a dimer. Now we can have monomer, dimer, meaning two. We can have trimer, meaning three. And eventually it becomes so many that we just call it a polymer. But there are prefixes you can put before, whereas di means two. So now we have a dimer, we have a bond formed, and also in the process, we formed a molecule of H2O, or water, which then leaves the monomers. How does the water get formed? Well, you need to look at the groups in the monomer. Whatever monomer we're talking about, whether this be an amino acid or a monosaccharide or whatever, there's always going to be the coming together of two groups. There's going to be the OH of one monomer and an H of another monomer. And this is where the water comes. It's called a hydroxyl group, which is an OH from one monomer, and a hydrogen just on its own as an H from another monomer. So as these two come together, they form their bond, but in doing that bond formation, they have to lose these groups because they're in the way. So these snip off and form a water molecule. So you get your dimer, which is formed, and H2O. So it's the OH of one monomer and the H of another. And you'll find that any monosaccharide or amino acid or individual nucleotides will always have OH and H groups. And looking back on those carbon skeletons of those molecules, you can spot these quite easily. So by definition, a condensation reaction is a reaction that occurs when two molecules combine to form a more complex molecule with the removal of water. And that can be a monomer joining a chain or just two monomers binding together. So that's how we make polymers. What about breaking them down? For example, if we're digesting foods. Polymers are broken down into individual monomers by hydrolysis reactions. So this is going backwards now. This is the reverse of condensation. So here we have a polymer breaking down into individual monomers, and this is known as hydrolysis. Hydrolysis breaking it down, condensation would be forming it. And in this respect, we can talk about it as the reverse of condensation. Hydrolysis reactions require water, so we have to put water in, in order to break the bond between the monomers. So here we have a dimer formed of two monomers and a bond. In order to break that bond, a water molecule is added and it goes into the bond and pulls the monomers apart because what the water is now doing is replacing these two groups where one monomer has that hydroxyl group and the other monomer is given a hydrogen. And you can see that water can provide these because we've got two H's and an O. And then when these groups form, the bond can no longer form because they're sort of in the way. The chemistry is different. 
So now the monomers separate and we're left with two monomers. So you can see how it's the direct reverse of condensation, where in the condensation reaction, we removed water to make that bond. So by definition, a hydrolysis reaction is a reaction occurring when larger molecules are broken down into smaller molecules with the addition of water. So the condensation and hydrolysis reactions are used to build up or break down all of the biological molecules, lipids, nucleic acids, proteins, and carbohydrates. And here's a table just to summarize them. In condensation, monomers are joined together, whereas in hydrolysis, monomers are broken apart. Condensation forms water, and hydrolysis requires water. If you have trouble remembering which is which, remember that condensation is what you see on the sort of mirror in the bathroom or on a cold bottle, where water starts forming in droplets. So it's forming water. And hydrolysis, well, lysis means to break. So in this case, we're adding water and we're breaking it into two to make those groups again. And in condensation, we form a bond, whereas hydrolysis, we're breaking. Again, breaking, break, lysis. And condensation and hydrolysis reactions are very important reactions taking place in all the cells of organisms. So they're examples of metabolic reactions making useful products. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.